After a messy breakup, Mia found herself reluctantly joining Tinder at the urging of her best friend, Sarah. Sarah had met her boyfriend on the app and insisted that Mia give it a try, claiming it was the easiest way to move on and just a bit of fun. Mia wasn't so sure? She wasn't in the mood for dating, but she did miss having someone to talk to. So, one rainy Saturday afternoon, she downloaded the app and created a profile. She spent the next few days, swiping through profiles, mostly out of boredom. There were a lot of guys, but none of them stood out to her. Some of the conversations fizzled out quickly, and a few were downright creepy. She started to wonder if the whole thing was a waste of time. Then, she saw his profile. He went by the name Jack. His pictures were simple but captivating, tall, with dark hair and piercing blue eyes. He wasn't posing or showing off like so many other guys on the app. In one photo, he was sitting by a campfire, staring pensively into the flames, in another, he was hiking in the mountains, his face half-lit by the sunset. There was something mysterious about him that caught her attention immediately. His profile bio was brief, adventurer. Love the outdoors. Looking for someone to share stories and experiences with. Mia hesitated for a moment but eventually swiped right. To her surprise, it was an instant match. They started chatting that same evening, and the conversation was surprisingly easy. Jack was charming, funny, and seemed genuinely interested in getting to know her. They talked about their favorite movies, books, and their love for travel. Jack told her about a hiking trip he'd taken through the Rockies and how he loved spending time in remote places, far away from the chaos of the city. Mia found herself drawn to him. There was something different about Jack, he wasn't like the other guys she'd talked to on the app. He seemed thoughtful, deep, and just a little bit mysterious. After a few days of texting back and forth, Jack suggested they meet in person. I'd love to take you out somewhere special, he wrote. There's this great little spot I know, a bit off the beaten path, but it's beautiful. Mia was hesitant. She barely knew him, and meeting someone from Tinder in a secluded location didn't sound like the smartest idea. But Jack reassured her, promising it would be a fun, casual afternoon. It's a hidden gem, he said. I promise you'll love it. Against her better judgment, Mia agreed to meet him the following weekend. When Saturday arrived, Mia felt a mixture of excitement and nervousness. She texted Sarah, telling her all about Jack and the plan to meet him in person. Sarah was excited for her, but also cautious. Make sure you share your location with me, Sarah insisted. And if anything feels off, just leave. Mia agreed, though she reassured her friend that everything would be fine. Jack seemed genuine, and she didn't get any red flags from their conversations. Still, she couldn't shake the slight unease that had settled in the pit of her stomach. Jack sent her a location just outside the city, near an old hiking trail that wasn't widely known. It was an hour's drive away, but Mia didn't mind. She liked the idea of being outdoors and away from the usual crowded bars or coffee shops. When she arrived at the trailhead, there was no one else around. The area was quiet, surrounded by dense trees. She parked her car and texted Jack to let him know she was there. Moments later, a black SUV pulled up next to her, and Jack stepped out. He was even more attractive in person, tall, with an easy smile and an air of confidence that made her feel at ease. His eyes, however, were even more intense than in his pictures, a striking blue that seemed to pierce right through her. Hey, he greeted her warmly. I'm glad you made it. Me too, Mia replied, smiling nervously. Jack led her down the trail, talking easily about the area, and how he'd discovered it on one of his solo hikes. He told her about a hidden lake just a short walk away, where they could sit and enjoy the view. 
As they walked deeper into the woods, Mia couldn't help but notice how quiet it was. There were no other hikers, no birds, just the crunch of their footsteps on the leaf-covered path. The trees seemed to close in around them, blocking out much of the sunlight. So, do you come here often? Mia asked, trying to make conversation and ease the growing unease in her chest. Every now and then, Jack replied with a grin. It's a good place to get away. Something about the way he said it made her stomach tighten, but she pushed the feeling aside. Maybe she was just overthinking things. After about twenty minutes of walking, they reached the lake. It was beautiful, exactly as Jack had described. The water was still and clear, surrounded by towering pines. The scene was so peaceful that for a moment, Mia forgot about her worries. They sat on a large rock by the shore, talking and laughing. Jack was easy to be around, and his calm demeanor helped Mia relax. But as the sun began to dip lower in the sky, casting long shadows across the forest, Jack's behavior started to change. He grew quieter, his gaze lingering on Mia for just a little too long. The conversation, once easy and flowing, began to feel forced. Mia felt a chill in the air, though the temperature hadn't dropped. I should probably head back soon, she said, glancing at the fading sunlight. I don't want to be out here after dark. Jack smiled, but there was something unsettling about it. What's the rush? We're just getting started. Mia's heart raced. Something was off, she could feel it in the way Jack's tone had shifted, in the sudden intensity of his gaze. Her instinct screamed at her to leave, but she didn't want to appear rude or paranoid. Maybe we could come back another time, she suggested, standing up. It's getting late, and I have to work tomorrow. Jack remained seated, his eyes locked on her. You know, he said slowly, it's funny. I bring people out here sometimes, but you're the first one to get nervous so quickly. Mia's pulse quickened. What do you mean? He stood up, brushing off his hands, his expression unreadable. Most people are more trusting. They don't want to leave so soon. Her mind raced, every nerve in her body on high alert. I think I should go, she said, taking a step back. Jack's smile widened. Go ahead, Mia. But don't you want to know why I really brought you here? Panic surged through her, and she turned to leave, but before she could take another step, Jack grabbed her wrist with a sudden, frightening strength. His grip was like iron. You've been fun, he said, his voice low and menacing. But I think our little adventure is just getting started. Mia's heart pounded in her chest as she tried to yank her arm free, but Jack held tight. She could see now that the charming, adventurous man she'd been talking to for weeks was gone, replaced by someone, or something, much darker. She fought against him, twisting and pulling with all her strength. Let go of me. But Jack only tightened his grip, his blue eyes cold and unfeeling. There's no one around, Mia? No one to hear you. Terror shot through her, but adrenaline took over. She kicked at him, catching him in the shin, and for a moment, his grip loosened. She tore herself free and bolted down the path, not looking back. Mia ran blindly through the woods, branches whipping at her face and arms. She could hear Jack's footsteps behind her, quick and steady, not far behind. Her lungs burned, and her legs ached, but she couldn't stop. She had to get away. The path seemed to stretch endlessly ahead, twisting and turning through the dense forest. She could barely see where she was going, her vision blurred by panic and tears. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig made her heart leap. She glanced back once, and there he was, Jack, not far behind, moving with an eerie calmness, as though he was toying with her. You can't run forever, Mia, he called after her, 
his voice echoing through the trees. She didn't respond. She couldn't. Her only focus was on getting away, on finding a way out of the forest. But the trail was unfamiliar, and the trees seemed to close in around her, twisting and looming like dark sentinels. She didn't know how far she had run, or if she was even going in the right direction. Suddenly, the ground beneath her gave way, and she tumbled down a steep embankment, crashing through the underbrush and landing hard at the bottom. Pain shot through her leg, but she bit back a cry, forcing herself to her feet. She was hidden now, deep in the shadows of the trees, and for a moment, she allowed herself to hope that she had lost him. But then she heard it, the slow, deliberate crunch of footsteps coming down the trail. Mia, Jack's voice called, calm and patient. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Mia crouched low, her heart pounding in her chest, trying to quiet her breathing. She knew that if Jack found her, she wouldn't have the strength to run again. She scanned the area, looking for any way out, but the embankment was too steep to climb, and there was no clear path through the dense forest. She was trapped. The footsteps grew closer, slower now, as though Jack knew she was nearby and was savoring the hunt. I know you're close, he called softly. I can hear you breathing. Mia clamped her hand over her mouth, fighting to stay silent. Her mind raced, searching for a plan, but there was nothing, no way out, no way to call for help. She was alone. Then, suddenly, the footsteps stopped. Silence hung heavy in the air. Mia's heart thudded in her ears, and for a moment, she dared to hope that he had given up, that he had lost interest. But then, from directly behind her, Jack's voice whispered, Found you. Days later, Mia's car was found abandoned at the trailhead, but there was no sign of her. Search parties combed the area, but it was as though she had vanished into thin air. No one knew what had happened to her, and Jack, the charming stranger with the blue eyes, had disappeared as well. A month later, another woman on Tinder swiped right on a man named Jack. His pictures were different, but the eyes were the same. It had been a long week for Lucy. Endless work meetings, sleepless nights, and the constant, gnawing feeling that her life had become stagnant. In an effort to shake things up, she turned to Tinder, hoping for a distraction or maybe even someone new to break the monotony. She wasn't new to the app, she had used it before with mixed results. Most of the guys she matched with were uninteresting, and the few dates she'd been on hadn't gone anywhere. Still, the lure of finding someone intriguing kept pulling her back. One night, as she lay in bed, swiping through profiles, she came across Ben. His profile was sparse but intriguing. He had dark hair and deep, brown eyes, and his pictures had an artistic quality, somewhere between candid and intentional. One of him smiling on a beach, another of him at a bar with friends, and a final one of him staring into the camera, with an expression that seemed to look right through the screen. His bio was short, love adventure. Seeking someone to explore the world with. Something about his photos made Lucy stop. There was a sense of mystery in his eyes, and she found herself swiping right almost instinctively. Moments later, her phone buzzed, it's a match. Her heart skipped a beat. It was silly, she thought, getting excited over a match on an app, but something about Ben had hooked her. To her surprise, he messaged her almost immediately. Ben, hey Lucy. You seem like someone who enjoys a good adventure. Tell me about the best one you've had. The conversation started easily, flowing effortlessly between them. Ben was charming, funny, and surprisingly deep. They talked about their favorite places, their dreams, and the things they feared. Lucy found herself smiling as she typed, and for the first time in weeks, she felt genuinely excited about meeting someone new. After a few days of talking, Ben suggested they meet in person. 
I know a cool little bar downtown, he texted. It's quiet, perfect for a first date. What do you say? Lucy hesitated for a moment. Meeting people from dating apps always made her nervous, but Ben seemed different. He was smart, witty, and kind. Besides, she was ready for a change. Let's do it, she replied, her heart racing. They agreed to meet the following Friday evening. Friday arrived, and Lucy was filled with a mixture of excitement and nerves. She chose a simple yet flattering outfit, something casual but nice. As she stood in front of the mirror, checking her reflection, her phone buzzed. Ben, looking forward to tonight. You'll love this place. 8 p.m. sharp. Lucy smiled and grabbed her purse. The bar was tucked away in a quieter part of the city, not too far from her apartment. She'd never been there before but trusted Ben's suggestion. When she arrived, the bar was just as Ben had described, small, dimly lit, with a cozy atmosphere. The kind of place where people came to talk, not just to drink. She looked around but didn't see him right away. Checking her phone, she saw it was exactly 8 p.m. A few minutes passed, and still no sign of Ben. Lucy ordered a drink, trying to shake off the creeping unease that was slowly building in her stomach. After 15 minutes, she sent him a message, Hey, I'm here. Where are you? No response? Half an hour later, she checked her phone again. Still nothing. She stared at the glowing screen, her excitement draining into disappointment. Was she being stood up? Just as she was about to leave, her phone buzzed. She glanced at the screen. Ben, I'm here. Look to your right. Her heart leapt. She turned to the right, scanning the dimly lit bar, but there was no one that fit Ben's description. The only people nearby were a group of older men talking at a table, and a couple huddled in the corner, deep in conversation. Confused, she typed back, I don't see you. A minute later, his response came, I see you. A chill ran down her spine. She glanced around the bar again, her pulse quickening. Where was he? Why hadn't she seen him walk in? Suddenly, she had the overwhelming sense that she was being watched. Lucy's mind raced as she scanned the room once more, trying to keep her cool. Had she missed him entering? Was this some kind of weird joke? The bar wasn't large, and it didn't seem like there were any obvious places to hide. Her phone buzzed again. Ben, come outside. I'm waiting. Her unease deepened. She stood, grabbed her jacket, and cautiously made her way outside. The cool night air hit her as she stepped onto the street. The bar's entrance was dimly lit, the street quiet except for the occasional passing car. She looked left, then right, but there was no sign of Ben. The street was practically deserted. Her phone buzzed once more. Ben, I'm across the street. Lucy squinted across the road, but all she saw was an empty sidewalk and the outline of trees in the park beyond. There was no one standing there, no Ben waiting for her. What the hell is going on? She thought, her stomach twisting with fear. She typed out a quick message, I don't see you. Are you messing with me? This time, the response was immediate. Ben, I'm right here, Lucy. Don't be afraid. The words sent a cold shiver down her spine. She instinctively stepped back toward the bar, her heart pounding in her chest. Something was very, very wrong. She hurried back inside, feeling the warmth of the bar's interior wash over her. Taking a seat near the entrance, she frantically scanned the room again. Still no sign of Ben. She sent one last message, this isn't funny. I'm leaving. 
there was no response. After another few minutes of sitting in tense silence, she grabbed her things and left, rushing down the street without looking back. The next morning, Lucy awoke feeling unsettled. She couldn't shake the eerie sensation of the previous night, the strange messages, the feeling of being watched. She opened Tinder to unmatch Ben, but when she went to his profile, it was gone. His messages, his pictures, everything had disappeared. Confused, she searched for his name, but there was no trace of him on the app. It was as if he had never existed. She texted Sarah, telling her about the strange encounter. Sarah replied quickly, that's so weird. Maybe he blocked you. That didn't feel right, though. Why would he block her after behaving so bizarrely? And why hadn't she seen him in the first place? Later that day, Lucy couldn't resist doing a quick Google search for Ben Tinder horror stories. What she found sent chills down her spine. There were dozens of posts, some dating back several years, all about mysterious profiles on Tinder, profiles of men who seemed normal at first, but who would disappear after arranging a date. The women in these stories all described a similar experience. Being told to meet somewhere, waiting in vain, receiving strange messages about being watched, and then. Nothing. The profiles would vanish, and the men were never seen or heard from again. One post, in particular, caught her eye. It was from a woman who claimed to have matched with a man named Ben. The description matched Lucy's perfectly, same photos, same messages, same disappearance. The woman ended her post with a warning, if you match with Ben, don't meet him. You won't be alone. For the next few days, Lucy tried to move on from the bizarre incident, but the unease lingered. She stopped using Tinder, feeling like the app had betrayed her. The weirdness of Ben's disappearance, and the fact that other women had experienced something similar, haunted her. Then, one night, as she sat alone in her apartment, her phone buzzed. It was a text from an unknown number. Hey, Lucy. It's Ben. I've been thinking about you. Her blood ran cold. How did he get her number? She hadn't given it to him. She blocked the number immediately, her hands trembling. How was this happening? Was someone playing a cruel joke on her? The phone buzzed again, despite the block. You shouldn't have run away that night. Panic surged through her. She called Sarah, telling her everything. Sarah tried to calm her down, but Lucy could hear the worry in her friend's voice. That night, Lucy locked every window and door in her apartment, double-checking everything before going to bed. But sleep didn't come easily. Every sound, every creak in the floorboards, made her heart race. At around 3 a.m., just as she was drifting off, her phone buzzed again. This time, the message was different. I'm outside your building, Lucy. Come outside. I want to see you. Lucy shot out of bed, her breath catching in her throat. She rushed to the window, carefully pulling back the curtain to peer outside. The street was dark and empty. No one was there? Another message, look closer. Her eyes darted back to the street, searching for any sign of movement. And then she saw him. A shadowy figure standing across the street, his face hidden in the dark, but she knew it was Ben. He stood perfectly still, watching her window. She dropped the curtain, her heart hammering in her chest. She dialed 911, her hands shaking as she tried to explain the situation. By the time the police arrived, the figure was gone, leaving nothing behind but the lingering terror. After that night, Lucy became a prisoner of her own fear. She stayed inside, terrified to go out, afraid that Ben, or whatever Ben was, was still watching her. She changed her phone number, deleted all her social media, 
and told her landlord about the strange man. But the messages didn't stop. They came from different numbers, always the same eerie tone, I'm waiting, Lucy. Come outside. We're not done. One night, after weeks of torment, she received a final message. You'll never get rid of me. Lucy was sitting in her darkened apartment, staring at the message, when her phone screen suddenly glitched. The light flickered, the image on her screen distorting into static for a moment before returning to normal. But when the screen cleared, the text app was gone. In its place was Tinder. And there, on her screen, was a new message from Ben. I'm inside. Lucy moved out of her apartment the following week, leaving the city behind. No one ever heard from Ben again, but Lucy knew better. Whatever he was, whoever he was, he wasn't just a man she had matched with on Tinder. He was something else. Something that couldn't be blocked, deleted, or ignored. And she knew, deep down, that one day, he would come back. Because Ben wasn't just a match. He was a ghost. And some ghosts never go away. After a long string of bad dates and one particularly painful breakup, Rachel was ready to give dating a break. Her friends, however, had other plans. They convinced her that Tinder was the way to go, a chance to meet someone new, to have a little fun without the pressures of a traditional relationship. At first, Rachel was hesitant. She'd heard all the stories, catfishes, ghosting, awkward meetups, but after a few glasses of wine and some late-night encouragement from her best friend, Emma, she downloaded the app. She wasn't looking for anything serious, just a distraction. It didn't take long before she found herself scrolling through endless profiles, swiping left on most and right on a few. A lot of the guys seemed the same, selfies at the gym, group photos where you couldn't tell who was who, and bios that ranged from overly cheesy to completely blank. It wasn't exactly inspiring. Then, she came across his profile. His name was Tom. Unlike the others, his profile wasn't filled with selfies. Instead, there were a few artistic shots, a moody black and white of him, in a leather jacket leaning against a motorcycle, another of him standing on a cliff's edge with the sun setting behind him, and a third where he was sitting in a cozy cafe, staring out of the window. He looked rugged, mysterious, and his bio was short and simple, looking for something real. Rachel hesitated for a moment before swiping right. Within minutes, the notification popped up. It's a match. Her heart raced a little. Tom messaged her almost immediately. Hey there. I'm glad we matched. You seem interesting. The conversation flowed easily. Tom was charming, witty, and attentive. He asked Rachel questions about herself, her favorite books, movies, places she wanted to travel, and seemed genuinely interested in her answers. There was something disarming about him, a calm confidence that made Rachel feel comfortable, even through the screen. They talked for a few days, and every message left Rachel wanting more. Tom had a way of making her feel special, like she was the only person he was talking to. He didn't push for anything too fast, didn't come off as sleazy or desperate. He seemed perfect. After a week of chatting, Tom suggested they meet in person. I know a great little bar downtown, he wrote. It's quiet, cozy, perfect for getting to know each other. Rachel hesitated for a moment. Meeting someone from Tinder was always a gamble. But Tom didn't give her any weird vibes. He seemed safe, normal. Plus, the bar he suggested was in a busy part of town, and she could always text Emma to check in. Against her better judgment, she agreed to meet him. The bar Tom suggested was tucked away on a quiet street, hidden behind a row of trees. It wasn't a place Rachel had heard of before, but when she arrived, she understood why Tom liked it. 
The lighting was dim, the decor vintage and eclectic, with old leather couches and flickering candles on every table. It had a warm, inviting feel. Rachel arrived a little early and ordered a drink, nervously glancing at the door. She was always nervous before first dates, but this one felt different. She couldn't shake the butterflies in her stomach, a mix of excitement and anxiety. After about ten minutes, Tom walked in. He looked even better in person. Tall, broad-shouldered, with dark hair that fell slightly into his eyes. He had a confident walk and an easy smile that immediately put her at ease. Rachel? He asked, his voice smooth and deep. That's me, she replied with a smile, standing to greet him. They sat together at a small table in the corner, the conversation flowing as easily as it had online. Tom was charming, just as he had been in his messages, and his presence was magnetic. He made Rachel laugh, and she found herself opening up to him more than she usually would on a first date. The evening passed quickly, and before Rachel knew it, they were the last two people in the bar. The bartender gave them a knowing look as he wiped down the counters, signaling it was time to go. Let me walk you to your car, Tom offered as they stepped outside. Rachel hesitated for a moment, but it was late, and the street was quiet. She agreed, and they made their way down the block to where she had parked. As they reached her car, Tom leaned in close, his eyes locking onto hers. I had a great time tonight, Rachel. Me too, she replied, her voice soft. She could feel her heart racing, and for a moment, she thought he might kiss her. But instead, he reached out and brushed a lock of hair behind her ear. His touch was light, but something about it made her shiver. There was an intensity in his gaze that hadn't been there before. I hope we can do this again soon, he said, his voice almost a whisper. Rachel nodded, though something in her gut told her to be cautious. She smiled politely, unlocked her car, and got in. Tom stood there for a moment, watching her, his expression unreadable. Finally, he turned and walked away, disappearing into the shadows of the quiet street. The next day, Tom messaged her as usual, asking if she had gotten home safely and telling her how much he'd enjoyed their date. Rachel was flattered but still felt a little off about how the night had ended. She decided to shrug it off, convincing herself it was just first date jitters. But as the days went on, Tom's messages began to change. At first, they were sweet and charming, like before, but then they became more frequent, more demanding. He would text her constantly, asking what she was doing, who she was with, when they could meet again. At first, Rachel tried to be polite, telling him she was busy with work or seeing friends, but Tom didn't seem to take the hint. His messages became more possessive, asking why she wasn't replying immediately, why she didn't seem as interested as before. One evening, after a particularly long day at work, Rachel came home to find five missed calls from Tom and a string of messages that made her uneasy. Tom, why aren't you answering? Tom, are you with someone else? Tom, I thought we had something special. Tom, you shouldn't ignore me, Rachel. Her heart raced as she read the messages. She hadn't realized how quickly things had escalated. She decided to take a step back and stop responding for a while, hoping he'd get the message and leave her alone. But the next day, the messages continued. They were shorter now, more urgent. Tom, where are you? Tom, answer me. That night, as Rachel sat in her apartment, scrolling through her phone, her doorbell rang. Her heart nearly stopped. She wasn't expecting anyone. Cautiously, she approached the door, peeking through the peephole. No one was there? She opened the door slowly, stepping into the hallway. There, lying on the welcome mat, was a single rose. Rachel's stomach twisted. 
She slammed the door shut, locking it behind her, and immediately texted Emma. Rachel tried to convince herself that it was just a coincidence, that maybe someone had left the rose as a prank. But the next few days made it clear that Tom wasn't going to go away quietly. He continued to message her, each text more unsettling than the last. He began sending pictures, photos of places she had been recently, places she hadn't mentioned to anyone. The coffee shop she liked to visit on her lunch break, the park she jogged through every morning, her favorite bookstore. Each photo came with a chilling caption, I see you. Terrified, Rachel blocked his number, hoping that would put an end to it. But it didn't. The messages started coming from different numbers, each one more threatening than the last. Tom, you can't hide from me. Tom, I know where you live. Tom, I'm watching you. One night, as Rachel was leaving work, she saw him. Standing across the street, partially hidden by the shadows of a building, was Tom. He was watching her, his eyes fixed on her as she hurried to her car. She didn't stop. She didn't look back. She got into her car and drove home, her hands shaking on the wheel. That night, she barely slept. Every noise, every creak in her apartment made her jump. She felt like she was being watched, even from inside her own home. Rachel knew she couldn't go on like this. She called the police, but there wasn't much they could do. Without concrete evidence that Tom was threatening her, they couldn't take action. They advised her to change her number, her routines, to stay alert. But none of that made her feel safe. Tom was always one step ahead, always watching. A week later, Rachel was packing up her apartment, planning to move to a new place when it happened. It was late, and she was alone, surrounded by boxes, when the power suddenly went out. The apartment was plunged into darkness. Rachel froze, her heart pounding in her chest. Then, from outside the door, she heard it. A soft knock. Her blood ran cold. She crept to the door, peering through the peephole. At first, she saw nothing, just the empty hallway. But then, slowly, a figure stepped into view. It was Tom. He was standing there, staring directly at the peephole, his face pale and expressionless. His hand reached out, pressing against the door as though he could feel her presence just on the other side. Rachel, he whispered, his voice muffled through the door. I know you're in there. Her breath caught in her throat. She backed away from the door, her hands shaking, searching for her phone. She had to call someone, anyone? But before she could dial, she heard the door handle rattle. He was trying to get in. Rachel's heart raced as she dialed 911, her voice trembling as she whispered for help. She could hear Tom outside, pacing, muttering to himself. I thought we were perfect together, Rachel, he said through the door, his voice low and unnerving. Why did you have to ruin it? Minutes felt like hours as she crouched in the corner of her apartment, waiting for the police to arrive. She could hear Tom banging on the door, his patience wearing thin. I just want to talk, he said, his voice growing louder. Let me in, Rachel. Suddenly, there was a loud crash, and the door burst open. Rachel screamed as Tom stepped inside, his eyes wild, his face twisted with anger. You shouldn't have ignored me, he hissed, moving toward her. But before he could reach her, the sound of sirens filled the air. Tom froze, his head snapping toward the door. He hesitated for a moment, his eyes locking onto Rachel's, and then he turned and bolted. The police arrived seconds later, bursting into the apartment, but Tom was already gone. Weeks passed, but Tom was never caught. The police searched for him, but he had disappeared without a trace, vanishing as suddenly as he had appeared in Rachel's life. 
Rachel moved to a new apartment, changed her number, and deleted her Tinder account. But the fear never left her. Every shadow, every strange noise, every unexpected knock on the door sent her heart racing. She knew he was still out there, watching. And somewhere, Tom was swiping right on another profile, waiting for his next perfect match. Sam Parker had just moved into his first apartment, a small but cozy space on the outskirts of town. He had spent months saving up enough money to move out of his parents' place, and now he finally had the freedom he craved. But with freedom came responsibilities, and his tiny new apartment was missing some crucial elements, furniture. Sam had very little money left after the deposit and the first month's rent, so he turned to Craigslist in hopes of finding cheap, second-hand furniture. After a few days of browsing through endless listings of used couches, wobbly tables, and ugly lamps, Sam found what seemed like a perfect deal, a large, vintage wooden dresser in excellent condition for only $50. The post was simple, almost too simple, with just one picture of the dresser, a beautifully crafted dark wood piece that looked like it belonged in a century-old mansion. The description was vague, old dresser. In good condition. Fifty dollars. Must pick up. Despite the minimal details, Sam was intrigued. He'd always had an appreciation for old, antique furniture, and this dresser looked like it could be worth much more than the asking price. Without thinking twice, he messaged the seller, a man named Mr. Albright, to arrange a pickup. The next evening, Sam received a reply from Mr. Albright, who gave him an address that was on the outskirts of town, near a quiet, run-down neighborhood. The location was about 30 minutes away, and though Sam found it odd that the seller lived in such an isolated area, he brushed it off. It was Craigslist, after all. People sold things from all kinds of places. Sam drove out to the address the following night. As he pulled up, he found himself at the end of a long, narrow dirt road. At the end of the road was a large, old Victorian-style house, looming against the backdrop of a moonlit sky. The place looked abandoned, its windows dark, and the yard overgrown with weeds. He couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, but he figured that maybe the owner had fallen on hard times and was trying to sell off some possessions. He parked his car and walked up to the porch, where a dim light flickered from inside. The front door creaked open, and a tall, gaunt man with thinning hair and sunken eyes stepped out. You must be Sam, the man said, his voice gravelly and hoarse. I'm Mr. Albright. Ah, uh, yeah, Sam replied trying to hide his unease. I'm here for the dresser. Follow me, Mr. Albright said, motioning for Sam to come inside. The interior of the house was even more unsettling than the outside. The air was thick and musty, and the walls were lined with old portraits of people long since dead, their eyes seeming to follow Sam as he walked through the narrow hallway. Cobwebs hung from the ceiling, and the wooden floor creaked with every step. Mr. Albright led Sam into a dimly lit room at the back of the house. In the corner of the room sat the dresser. Up close, it was even more stunning than the picture had shown, a dark mahogany piece with intricate carvings and brass handles. It looked like it belonged in a museum, not in an old, decaying house. Beautiful, isn't it? Mr. Albright said, his voice low. Yeah, it's... Amazing, Sam replied, running his fingers along the smooth wood. Are you sure you only want fifty bucks for this? Mr. Albright's smile was strange, almost too wide. Yes. I just want it gone. As soon as possible. Something in the way he said it made Sam pause, but the allure of the dresser was too strong. He handed over the money, and with Mr. Albright's help, they loaded the heavy piece into the back of Sam's car. Be careful with it, Mr. Albright said as Sam climbed into the driver's seat. Take good care of it. 
His tone sent a chill down Sam's spine, but he nodded and drove off, eager to get back home. Sam got back to his apartment late that night and unloaded the dresser, carefully setting it up against the wall in his bedroom. It fit perfectly with the rest of his decor, giving the room an old-world charm that he loved. Exhausted from the long day, Sam fell into bed, staring at the dresser from across the room. He smiled, feeling proud of the find. But as he drifted off to sleep, a strange feeling washed over him, a sense that he wasn't alone. In the middle of the night, Sam awoke suddenly, his heart pounding. The room was pitch black, and the only sound was the low hum of the refrigerator in the next room. He sat up, glancing around the room, but nothing seemed out of place. Then, he heard it, a faint, barely audible sound. It was coming from the dresser. A soft creaking, like wood shifting. He stared at it for a long moment, frozen in place. The dresser was solid wood, there was no reason it should be making noises like that. Old furniture, he muttered to himself, lying back down. It's probably just settling. But as he closed his eyes, the creaking grew louder. He opened his eyes again, and for a split second, he could have sworn he saw the bottom drawer move. Just a tiny shift, as if something inside had pushed against it. Sam sat up again, now wide awake. He stared at the dresser, his skin crawling. He wasn't sure if he was imagining it or if something was actually moving. Swallowing hard, he got out of bed and walked over to the dresser. Slowly, he pulled open the bottom drawer. It was empty. There was nothing inside except for a few small scratches on the wood, old and worn. He closed the drawer and stood there for a moment, listening to the silence. Nothing. Just his mind playing tricks on him, he thought. He went back to bed, but sleep didn't come easily. Over the next few days, strange things began to happen. Sam started hearing noises at night, soft scratching sounds coming from the dresser, like nails scraping against the wood. At first, he tried to ignore it, chalking it up to the house settling or his own imagination. But the noises grew more frequent, and more unsettling. One morning, he noticed something strange. The scratches on the inside of the bottom drawer had grown deeper, as if something was trying to claw its way out. The wood was splintered and uneven, with fresh marks that hadn't been there before. Unease began to gnaw at him. He couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong with the dresser, something he couldn't explain. One night, the scratching became unbearable. It was louder, more frantic, as if something inside the dresser was desperately trying to escape. Sam jumped out of bed, grabbing a flashlight, and approached the dresser cautiously. With trembling hands, he pulled open the bottom drawer. This time, the inside was covered in deep gouges, and the air around it felt cold, unnaturally cold. Suddenly, the drawer slammed shut on its own, and the dresser shook violently. Sam stumbled back, his heart racing. Something was inside the dresser, something he couldn't see, but he could feel it. And whatever it was, it wanted out. Terrified, Sam decided to do some research on the dresser, hoping to find an explanation for the strange occurrences. He combed through the internet, searching for any clues about the origin of the piece or its previous owners. But no matter how hard he looked, he couldn't find anything. Desperate for answers, Sam returned to Craigslist and tried to contact Mr. Albright. But when he pulled up the original listing, it was gone, completely erased, as if it had never existed. He searched for the address Mr. Albright had given him, but it didn't show up on any map. It was as though the house had never been there. Panic began to set in. Had he imagined the entire thing? Or was he dealing with something far worse than he could have imagined? Determined to get rid of the dresser, Sam called a local antique dealer, hoping to sell it. The dealer agreed to come by and take a look. 
When the dealer arrived, he immediately sensed something was wrong. This piece? It's very old, the dealer said, running his hand over the wood. But there's something off about it. Sam explained the noises, the scratches, and the strange coldness, but the dealer seemed reluctant to believe him. I've seen a lot of old furniture, the dealer said. But I've never encountered anything like this. Are you sure? Before he could finish, the bottom drawer slowly slid open on its own. The room grew cold, and a faint whisper filled the air, so quiet it was almost imperceptible. The dealer backed away, his face pale. I, I can't take this, he stammered, turning toward the door. You need to get rid of it. Burn it? Do whatever you have to, but get it out of your house. With that, he fled, leaving Sam alone with the cursed dresser. That night, the noises grew louder. The dresser creaked and groaned, and the bottom drawer rattled violently, as if something inside was trying to break free. The whispers were clearer now, forming words that Sam couldn't understand but that chilled him to his core. Desperate, Sam tried to move the dresser, but it was impossibly heavy, as though it had rooted itself to the floor. He grabbed a crowbar, determined to pry it open and see what was inside. As he wedged the crowbar into the gap of the bottom drawer, the dresser shook violently, the wood splintering under the pressure. A foul odor filled the room, rotting and decayed, like something long dead. Suddenly, the drawer flew open, and Sam stumbled back, dropping the crowbar. Inside the drawer was something he hadn't expected, an old, yellowed envelope, sealed with wax. His hands shaking, Sam picked up the envelope and carefully opened it. Inside was a letter, written in spidery handwriting that was barely legible. As he read it, his heart raced. To whoever possesses this dresser, beware. The spirit of a vengeful soul is bound within. This was once the property of a man who wronged many in life, and in death, he was cursed to remain within the wood, never to find peace. The scratching you hear is his attempt to escape. If you have found this letter, it may be too late. The only way to rid yourself of this curse is to destroy the dresser. Burn it, and scatter the ashes far from where you live. A cold sweat broke out across Sam's forehead as the truth sunk in. The dresser was cursed. Whatever spirit was trapped inside was growing stronger, and it wanted out. Without wasting any more time, Sam dragged the dresser outside. It was heavy, far heavier than it had been when he first brought it into the apartment, but adrenaline and fear gave him strength. He doused the dresser in gasoline, his hands shaking as he flicked the lighter and tossed it onto the wood. The flames roared to life, engulfing the dresser in an inferno. The wood crackled and hissed as the fire consumed it, but for a moment, Sam swore he heard something else, a scream, faint and distant, coming from within the flames. He stood there, watching as the dresser burned to ash, the smoke rising into the night sky. The whispers were gone, and the coldness that had filled his apartment dissipated. By morning, there was nothing left but a pile of smoldering ashes. Sam swept them into a metal bin and drove far out of town, scattering the ashes in a remote field. When he returned home, the apartment felt lighter. The oppressive presence was gone, and for the first time in weeks, Sam felt like he could breathe again. But as he lay in bed that night, just before he drifted off to sleep, he thought he heard it again, a faint, distant scratching, coming from somewhere deep within the walls. A week later, a new Craigslist listing appeared. Antique dresser for sale. Beautiful condition. Must pick up. Fifty dollars. It had been a rough few months for Ethan. Between losing his job and trying to scrape together enough to pay rent, life had become a constant battle with bills. His once bustling freelance design business had dried up, and he was on the verge of giving up when a simple solution presented itself, sell some of his stuff. 
he wasn't attached to much? After all, things were just things right. So, one evening, he logged onto Craigslist, hoping to find someone interested in buying some of his furniture, electronics, and old gear. Within a few hours, he had listed everything he was willing to part with. His laptop, an old gaming console, and even a couple of art pieces he had collected over the years. It didn't take long for replies to roll in. Amid the typical lowball offers and spam messages, one email caught his eye. The subject line read, Vintage Mirror, Urgent. Ethan had listed an old mirror he found at a flea market years ago. It was a large, ornate thing with a heavy brass frame, designed with strange symbols etched around its edges. He didn't think much of it when he bought it, but it had always added a unique charm to his apartment. The email was brief. I am very interested in the mirror. Will pay double your asking price. Can pick it up tonight. Please respond ASAP. Ethan was surprised. No one else had shown interest in the mirror, and it seemed like the least valuable thing he had listed. Curious, he checked the sender's name, M. Carver. There was no phone number, just the email address and a sense of urgency in the message. Double the asking price was tempting. Ethan was low on funds, and the idea of getting more than he'd hoped for was hard to pass up. Without thinking too much about it, he replied. It's still available. I'm home tonight if you want to come by and pick it up. The response came almost immediately. I'll be there at nine. Please have the mirror ready. Ethan glanced at the clock, it was already 8.15 p.m. He stood up, uneasily eyeing the mirror in his living room. The brass frame gleamed in the low light of his apartment, its surface reflecting the dim glow of his TV. He had always thought there was something strange about the mirror, though he couldn't put his finger on why. It had an unsettling quality, especially at night. It was as if the reflections within it were a little too sharp, the shadows a little too deep. Shrugging off his discomfort, he decided it was just the thought of someone coming to his apartment at night that made him feel uneasy. By 8.45, he had the mirror cleaned and ready to go, standing near the door. At precisely 9 p.m., there was a knock on Ethan's door. He peered through the peephole, expecting to see a middle-aged man or woman, perhaps someone with a truck or van to transport the large mirror. Instead, a tall, thin figure stood in the hallway, dressed in a long, dark overcoat. The man's head was bowed slightly, his features hidden beneath a wide-brimmed hat. Ethan hesitated for a moment. The figure outside didn't quite match the typical Craigslist buyer profile. Something about him felt off. But he pushed his unease aside. He needed the money, and this buyer was willing to pay double. Taking a deep breath, Ethan opened the door. The man stepped into the light of the hallway, revealing a pale, gaunt face. His eyes were a piercing grey, and his lips stretched into a thin smile that never reached his eyes. You must be Mr. Carver, Ethan said, forcing a smile. The man nodded slowly, his gaze immediately locking onto the mirror behind Ethan. Yes. May I see it? Ah, sure, Ethan replied, stepping aside to let him in. Carver walked past him without another word, his eyes fixed on the mirror as though nothing else in the apartment mattered. He approached it with an almost reverent air, his long fingers brushing lightly against the brass frame. For a moment, he stood completely still, just staring into the mirror's surface. It's perfect, Carver murmured, his voice barely audible. Ethan shifted uncomfortably. So, you really want it, huh? Carver turned to him, that eerie smile still on his face. Yes. As I said, I'll pay double. But I must ask, where did you find it? Ethan blinked. Oh, just a flea market a few years ago. 
I thought it looked cool, you know. Kind of old and unique. Carver's smile widened slightly, though it did nothing to make Ethan feel at ease. Yes. Very unique. Without another word, Carver reached into his coat and pulled out an envelope, handing it to Ethan. It was thick, far more than the amount Ethan had been expecting. Take it, Carver said. For your trouble. Ethan hesitated but took the envelope, quickly flipping through the bills inside. There was easily twice what he had listed the mirror for, maybe even more. Wow, this is more than enough, Ethan said, glancing back at Carver. You sure? Carver nodded, his eyes returning to the mirror. I'll take care of it from here. You won't need to worry about the mirror anymore. A chill ran down Ethan's spine at the man's words. Something about the way he said them, the finality in his tone, made Ethan uneasy. Ah, uh, do you need help carrying it out? Ethan asked, unsure if he wanted Carver to stay or leave quickly. No, Carver replied, his voice soft. It won't be necessary. Ethan stood awkwardly for a moment, unsure of what to say. Carver seemed entirely focused on the mirror, his long fingers tracing the symbols etched into the frame. Finally, feeling like he had overstayed his welcome in his own apartment, Ethan cleared his throat. Well, if you're good with it, I'll just head out. You can lock up when you're done. Carver didn't look at him, but nodded slightly. That will be fine. Without another word, Ethan grabbed his jacket and left the apartment, his mind racing with questions. Who was this guy? And why was he so obsessed with the mirror? Over the next few days, Ethan tried to forget about the strange encounter. He deposited the money, paid off some bills, and even treated himself to a night out. But despite his efforts, the image of Carver's pale face and the eerie way he had stared into the mirror lingered in his mind. It wasn't long before strange things began to happen. It started small. Ethan noticed things out of place in his apartment, items he knew he had left in one spot mysteriously moved to another. At first, he blamed it on stress or lack of sleep. Maybe he was just more distracted than he realized. But then came the dreams. Every night, Ethan found himself dreaming of the mirror. In his dreams, he stood in front of it, his reflection distorted, twisted. Shadows moved behind him in the mirror, dark shapes that didn't match the layout of his apartment. Sometimes, he would see Carver standing in the reflection, staring at him with those piercing grey eyes. The worst part was that the dreams felt real. So real, in fact, that when he woke up, he wasn't always sure if he had actually slept at all. His sheets would be tangled, his pillow damp with sweat. And always, the same overwhelming sense of dread clung to him. Then, one night, Ethan awoke to find the mirror back in his apartment. It was standing in the same spot where he had left it, the brass frame gleaming in the moonlight filtering through the window. For a moment, Ethan thought he was still dreaming, but when he reached out to touch the mirror, his fingers met cold, solid glass. He jumped back, his heart racing. How was this possible? He had sold the mirror to Carver. He had watched the man take it. But now it was back, and as he stared into its surface, he realized that something was horribly wrong. His reflection was. Wrong. It looked like him, but the eyes were different, darker, colder, almost as if someone else was looking out from behind his own face. Panicking, Ethan called Carver's number. The phone rang and rang, but no one answered. He sent an email, but the response never came. Desperate for answers, Ethan decided to dig deeper. He spent hours researching the symbols on the mirror, scouring the internet for any clue about its origins. Eventually, he stumbled upon an obscure online forum dedicated to occult objects. 
one of the users, who went by the name Watcher13, had posted about a similar mirror years ago. The post described a mirror that had been passed down through generations, believed to be cursed. The mirror, according to the legend, acted as a gateway, a portal between the living world and something far darker. Those who gazed into it for too long risked losing their souls, becoming trapped in the reflection while something else took their place in the real world. Ethan's blood ran cold as he read the post. The mirror in the description matched his exactly, the brass frame, the strange symbols, the eerie sense of unease that followed it. He tried reaching out to Watcher 13 for more information, but the account had been inactive for years. It seemed that whoever had owned the mirror before him had vanished, leaving nothing behind but warnings. That night, the dreams returned with a vengeance. This time, they were more vivid, more terrifying than before. In the dream, Ethan stood in front of the mirror, but his reflection was gone. Instead, there was nothing but darkness, a vast, endless void. And from that darkness, something began to crawl out. Long, twisted hands reached for him, pulling him toward the mirror. Ethan woke up screaming, drenched in sweat, the image of those hands seared into his mind. Ethan couldn't take it any more. He had to get rid of the mirror, once and for all. Grabbing a hammer, he approached the cursed object, his hands shaking. But as he raised the hammer to strike, his reflection in the mirror grinned at him, a wide, malicious smile that wasn't his own. He froze, the hammer slipping from his grasp. The reflection stepped forward, out of the mirror, and into the room. It was Ethan, but twisted, wrong. Its skin was pale, its eyes black pits of nothingness, and its smile was wide and unnatural. Thank you, it whispered, its voice a cold, hollow echo of his own. I've been waiting. Ethan stumbled back, but there was nowhere to run. The thing that had stepped out of the mirror lunged at him, its hands cold as death as they closed around his throat. As his vision faded, the last thing Ethan saw was his own face, smiling, victorious, staring down at him. Weeks later, another listing appeared on Craigslist. For sale, vintage mirror, unique design, perfect condition. One hundred dollars oboe. The seller's name was E. Carver, and the mirror, once again, awaited its next unsuspecting buyer. Paul had always been a bargain hunter. He loved scouring Craigslist for hidden gems, finding things that others were willing to part with for a fraction of their value. Whether it was vintage furniture, electronics, or rare collectibles, Paul always had an eye for a good deal. So when he stumbled upon an ad for an antique oak desk, solid wood, intricate carvings, listed for a ridiculously low price, he couldn't believe his luck. The desk was listed under the free section, and the description was brief, antique oak desk. In good condition, needs a good home. Must pick up tonight. First come, first served. There was one blurry picture of the desk, but even through the poor quality, Paul could tell it was a beautiful piece, probably worth hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars. The ad had only been posted an hour ago, and Paul immediately texted the number listed, asking if the desk was still available. Within minutes, he received a reply? Seller, yes, still available. Can you come pick it up tonight? Paul didn't hesitate. He replied that he could be there within the hour. The address was on the outskirts of town, in a more rural area, but Paul didn't mind the drive. A free desk like this was worth the trouble. As he loaded his pickup truck with a few tools, just in case the desk needed to be disassembled for transport, he couldn't help but feel a little giddy. This was exactly the kind of find he lived for, a treasure hidden in plain sight. He left a quick message with his girlfriend, Emily, letting her know where he was going. Picking up this amazing antique desk from Craigslist, he texted. Be back in a few hours. 
As he drove out of the city and into the more remote countryside, Paul's excitement grew. The sky was already dark, and the narrow road leading to the address was flanked by thick, looming trees. His GPS signal flickered in and out, but he eventually found the right turn-off, a long, gravel driveway that disappeared into the woods. The house at the end of the driveway was old and large, its windows dark. There were no cars in the driveway, and no lights on inside. For a moment, Paul felt a flicker of unease. He double-checked the address. This was definitely the place. He pulled up to the front of the house and parked, cutting the engine. His phone buzzed. Seller, I'm in the back. Just come around. Paul grabbed his flashlight and stepped out of the truck, the gravel crunching beneath his boots. The air was heavy with the smell of damp earth, and the wind rustled the trees overhead. The house loomed before him, its worn exterior casting long shadows in the moonlight. He made his way around the side of the house, his flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. When he reached the backyard, he saw the desk, just sitting there, under a sagging carport. It was even more beautiful in person. The wood was dark and rich, the carvings intricate and detailed, though the desk was covered in a thin layer of dust. But there was no one around. The yard was empty, silent. Hello. Paul called out, his voice sounding unnaturally loud in the stillness. No response? Paul approached the desk, running his hand along its surface. It was solid and heavy, definitely worth the trouble. He could probably flip it for a nice profit if he wanted to. Just as he was about to inspect the desk further, he heard a noise, a soft shuffling sound coming from the house. Paul turned, his flashlight scanning the windows, but he saw nothing. Hello. He called again, louder this time. There was no answer, but the uneasy feeling in his gut was growing stronger. Maybe the seller was inside, waiting for him to knock or come to the door. Paul hesitated. He didn't want to seem rude, but the situation was starting to feel. Off. Just as he was about to head back to his truck, his phone buzzed again. Seller, come inside. The front door is open. Paul stared at the message, the hair on the back of his neck standing on end. Something wasn't right. He hadn't seen anyone come to the front door, and the house looked abandoned. He pocketed his phone and decided that maybe this wasn't worth the trouble after all. The desk was great, but the whole situation was starting to feel wrong. He could always find another deal. As Paul turned to leave, a loud creaking sound echoed through the backyard. He whipped around, shining his flashlight toward the house. The back door was slowly swinging open, the darkness inside seeming to spill out into the yard. Paul's first instinct was to run. Every instinct in his body screamed that something wasn't right. But as he stood there, staring at the open door, a strange curiosity began to take over. Maybe the seller was inside, waiting for him. Maybe there was nothing to be afraid of. With a shaky breath, Paul took a step toward the door. He told himself that he was overreacting, that he'd been watching too many horror movies. The desk was still there, and he had already driven all the way out here. It couldn't hurt to take a quick look inside. His footsteps echoed on the creaky porch as he approached the open door. He hesitated for a moment, shining his flashlight into the house. The beam illuminated a dusty hallway, with old wooden floors and faded wallpaper. There was no sign of anyone. Hello. Paul called out again, his voice sounding small in the empty house. Still no answer. He stepped inside, his boots leaving prints in the dust. The air was musty, thick with the smell of mildew and decay. The house felt old, abandoned. But there was something else, something lurking beneath the surface. 
a faint smell, metallic and sharp, that made Paul's stomach turn. He moved down the hallway, his flashlight casting long shadows on the walls. The house was silent, save for the occasional creak of the floorboards beneath his feet. As he passed by a door on his left, he heard it again, a soft shuffling sound, like something moving just out of sight. Paul stopped, his heart pounding in his chest. He listened, straining to hear, but the sound was gone. Okay, he muttered to himself, his voice shaking. Time to get out of here. He turned to leave, but before he could take another step, his phone buzzed again. Sella, upstairs. Paul froze, staring at the message. How could the seller know where he was? A cold wave of fear washed over him, and he turned to leave. But as he stepped toward the front door, it slammed shut with a deafening crash. Paul jumped, his flashlight flickering as he spun around. The house was still, but the air felt thick with an unnatural tension. His pulse raced, and his breath came in shallow gasps. This wasn't normal. Something was very, very wrong. He had to get out of there? Paul sprinted toward the front door, grabbing the handle and yanking it open. But the door wouldn't budge. It was as if something was holding it shut, refusing to let him leave. His phone buzzed again. Sella, I said, upstairs. Panic surged through Paul, but he couldn't deny the chilling curiosity that gripped him. Against every instinct, he found himself walking toward the staircase at the end of the hall. He told himself that he would just look, just see who or what was up there, and then he would leave. The stairs groaned under his weight as he ascended, each step feeling heavier than the last. The darkness seemed to grow thicker the higher he went, and by the time he reached the top, his flashlight was flickering uncontrollably. He stood in the upstairs hallway, staring down the length of it. There were several closed doors on either side, and at the far end, one door stood slightly ajar, a faint light spilling out into the hallway. Paul's phone buzzed again. Seller, in the room? His heart pounded in his chest as he approached the door. The smell was stronger now, that same sharp, metallic scent that made his stomach churn. He reached for the doorknob with a trembling hand and pushed the door open. The room was small and dimly lit by a single, flickering bulb hanging from the ceiling. In the center of the room was a large, old-fashioned writing desk, identical to the one outside. But this one was covered in dark stains, its surface thratched and gouged. And sitting behind the desk was a man. Paul's blood ran cold. The man was slumped over, his head resting on the desk, his body still. His clothes were old and tattered, and his skin was pale, too pale. Paul took a step back, his breath catching in his throat. The man wasn't moving. He wasn't breathing. And then Paul saw it, the deep, jagged wound across the man's neck, blood pooling beneath him and dripping onto the floor. His phone buzzed again, and with shaking hands, Paul looked down at the screen. Seller, now you're mine? Panic overwhelmed him. Paul stumbled backward, nearly tripping over his own feet as he turned to run. He raced down the hallway, his flashlight flickering wildly, casting erratic shadows on the walls. The smell of blood was thick in his nostrils, and he could hear his own heartbeat pounding in his ears. The front door was still shut, but Paul didn't care. He ran toward it, slamming his shoulder against it, desperate to break free. The door didn't move. It felt as though it were bolted shut from the outside. His phone buzzed again. Sella, why are you running, Paul? His hands shook violently as he dropped the phone, no longer caring what the messages said. He ran back toward the rear of the house, hoping the back door would be unlocked. His breath was ragged, 
each inhale feeling harder as the air grew heavier. When he reached the back door, it, too, was sealed tight. He banged on it, desperate for any way out. His hands fumbled at the lock, but it wouldn't turn. The air around him felt stifling now, as if the house itself was closing in on him. And then he heard it. Footsteps. They were slow, deliberate, coming from the stairs behind him. Paul whipped around, his eyes wide with terror. At the top of the stairs stood the figure of a man, shrouded in shadow. The same man who had been slumped over the desk. Only now, he was standing. His face was obscured, but Paul could feel the figure's eyes on him, cold, dead eyes that watched his every movement. The figure took another step forward, the floorboards creaking beneath him. Paul's legs felt like lead, his body frozen in place by the sheer terror of what he was seeing. The figure moved closer, descending the stairs one slow, deliberate step at a time. In a desperate frenzy, Paul grabbed the nearest object, a heavy chair, and hurled it through the nearest window. The glass shattered with a deafening crash, and without thinking, Paul scrambled through the broken frame, cutting his arms and legs as he tumbled into the backyard. He didn't stop. Blood streamed down his arms from the cuts, but he kept running, sprinting across the yard and into the woods beyond. He didn't look back, didn't care if the figure was following him. All that mattered was getting as far away from that house as possible. By the time Paul made it back to his truck, he was shaking uncontrollably. His clothes were torn, his skin covered in dirt and blood. He fumbled with his keys, his hands trembling so badly that it took several tries to unlock the door. When he finally got inside, he slammed the door shut and locked it, breathing heavily as he stared out into the darkness. His mind raced, trying to make sense of what had just happened. His phone, which had been buzzing constantly in his pocket, had gone silent. Paul pulled it out and hesitated for a moment before looking at the screen. There were no new messages. In fact, all the messages from the seller had disappeared. The texts, the location, even the photos of the desk were gone, as if they had never existed. He sat in the truck for what felt like hours, trying to calm himself down. Eventually, he started the engine and drove away, leaving the house, and whatever had been inside it, far behind. In the weeks that followed, Paul tried to tell himself that it had all been some kind of hallucination, a nightmare brought on by stress or exhaustion. But no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't forget the man behind the desk, the messages on his phone, or the feeling of being trapped in that house. He never went back to Craigslist again. But sometimes, late at night, he would wake up to the sound of footsteps. Slow, deliberate footsteps, coming from just outside his door. And every time, his phone would buzz with a single, chilling message. I'm still waiting. Sam had always been on the hunt for a good deal. As a college student scraping by on part-time work and loans, he'd become a regular visitor to Craigslist, searching for second-hand furniture, electronics, and other things he needed. He loved the thrill of finding something valuable for cheap, whether it was an old bookshelf or a vintage camera. So when he stumbled across an ad for a high-end gaming laptop listed at an absurdly low price, he couldn't believe his luck. The listing was simple. Alien. Tech X20 gaming laptop, like new Dash $200. Moving out of town, must sell ASAP. Serious buyers only. Sam knew the Alien Tech X20, it was the kind of machine that retailed for nearly $2,000. The specs were insane, the kind of computer that could handle any game or task without breaking a sweat. The only thing that gave him pause was the price. $200 was a steal, too good to be true, perhaps. But the pictures of the laptop were clear, the condition pristine. The ad claimed that the seller was moving quickly and he did it gone fast, which could explain the price. 
still, something about it seemed off. There were no other details in the ad, just an email address. No phone number, no location. Just a simple call to serious buyers only. Despite his reservations, Sam's excitement got the better of him. He shot off an email to the address listed, expressing his interest and asking if the laptop was still available. Within an hour, he got a response. Yes, still available. Meet, tonight. 8 p.m. Here's the address. The email included an address on the outskirts of town, in a neighborhood Sam didn't recognize. He checked the location online and found that it was far from the main city, down a series of rural roads that eventually led to an area known for its large, isolated houses. The idea of meeting someone so far out was unsettling, but the allure of the deal overpowered his caution. Sam texted his friend Jake, telling him about the laptop. I'm heading out to pick it up tonight, he wrote. Jake responded almost immediately, sounds sketchy, man. You sure about this? It's Craigslist. Don't get murdered. Sam laughed it off, replying, it's fine. Just meeting someone in the suburbs. I'll text you the details. If anything goes wrong, you'll know. Sam grabbed his backpack, slipped a pocket knife into his jacket, just in case, and headed out the door. The sun was already setting by the time Sam reached the outskirts of town, casting long shadows across the quiet, empty streets. His GPS guided him deeper into unfamiliar territory, down narrow roads flanked by thick woods. It was the kind of area where houses were few and far between, hidden behind tall trees and long driveways. The address he was given led him to a large, old house that looked like it hadn't been maintained in years. The driveway was cracked and overgrown with weeds, and the windows were dark. The whole place had an eerie, abandoned feel to it. Sam's heart skipped a beat as he pulled up, his headlights illuminating the front of the house. He glanced at his phone, debating whether to turn back and call it a night. But then he reminded himself that he'd driven all this way for a deal that was almost too good to pass up. He could always leave if things felt off. He texted Jake the address, just in case. Here's where I'm meeting the guy. Shouldn't be long. Taking a deep breath, Sam got out of his car and walked up to the front door, his boots crunching on the gravel. The air felt heavy, and the silence was oppressive. He knocked on the door, the sound echoing hollowly through the house. A moment later, the door creaked open. A man in his late forties or early fifties stood there, his face partially hidden in the shadows. He was tall, lanky, with unkempt hair and a gaunt expression. His clothes were worn, and his eyes were a bit too intense as they locked onto Sam. You're here for the laptop. The man asked, his voice gravelly and low. Sam nodded, trying to suppress his growing unease. Yeah. You still have it? The man stepped back, opening the door wider. Come in. It's inside. For a brief second, Sam considered turning around and leaving. Something about the man's demeanor made his skin crawl. But he'd come this far, and he didn't want to back out now. He stepped inside, the door closing with a loud thud behind him. The inside of the house was worse than the outside. It smelled faintly of damp wood and mildew, and the lighting was dim, with only a few lamps scattered throughout. Old furniture, covered in dust, cluttered the living room, and the air felt thick, as though it hadn't been aired out in years. This way, the man said, gesturing toward a door at the back of the house. He moved with an awkward, jerking gait, leading Sam down a narrow hallway lined with old photographs. Sam tried not to look too closely, but he couldn't help noticing that many of the faces in the pictures looked sad, almost haunted. The hallway led to a small room at the back of the house, where a desk sat in the corner with a laptop on it. The laptop looked exactly like the one from the ad, 
an alien Tech X-20, shiny and new. There it is, the man said, his voice quieter now. You can check it out. Sam approached the desk, his hands shaking slightly. He picked up the laptop, turning it over in his hands. It felt solid, well kept, and real. But as he inspected it, something in the corner of his eye caught his attention, a small door at the back of the room, half hidden behind a shelf. It was slightly ajar, and from within, he could hear a faint sound, like someone. Breathing. Sam's blood ran cold. He set the laptop down and turned to face the man, who was standing unnervingly close behind him. Too close. I think I'm good, Sam said, trying to keep his voice steady. I'll take the laptop. Here's the money. He pulled out $200 from his wallet and handed it to the man, who took it without saying a word, his eyes never leaving Sam. As Sam picked up the laptop, he heard the breathing again, louder this time. And then? A voice? Help me? It was faint, barely audible, but unmistakable. A woman's voice, coming from behind that door. Sam's heart pounded in his chest. He turned sharply toward the door, his instincts screaming at him to run, but his curiosity, his need to understand what was happening, kept him rooted in place. The man followed his gaze, his eyes narrowing slightly. You should leave now, he said, his voice colder than before. Sam swallowed hard. His hand tightened around the strap of his backpack, and he took a step toward the door. Is someone in there? Leave, the man said again, more forcefully this time. Sam's adrenaline surged. Before he could think, he lunged for the door, pushing it open. The room beyond was small and dark, the air thick with the smell of damp and rot. A single light bulb hung from the ceiling, flickering weakly. In the center of the room was a woman, tied to a chair, her wrists bound with rope and her mouth gagged with a dirty cloth. Her eyes were wide with fear, and she was trembling violently. Sam froze, his mind racing. What the hell was going on? Before he could react, the man grabbed him from behind, shoving him hard against the wall. Sam's breath was knocked out of him, and he dropped the laptop, the sound of it hitting the floor echoing through the small room. What did I tell you? The man growled, his voice twisted with rage. You should have just left. Sam struggled against the man's grip, his mind spinning with terror. He had to get out of there? He had to help the woman. Using all his strength, Sam twisted around, shoving the man off him. He staggered back, but the man recovered quickly, his hands reaching for Sam again. In a panic, Sam reached into his jacket pocket, pulling out the small knife he'd brought with him. He flicked it open, pointing it at the man, who paused, his eyes narrowing. Stay back, Sam warned, his voice shaking. I swear I'll use this. The man smiled, a slow, twisted grin. You're not going anywhere. But before the man could move again, there was a loud crash from outside the room, the sound of the front door being kicked open. Police. Don't move. Everything happened in a blur after that. Sam barely registered the sound of footsteps thundering through the house, the shouts of officers as they rushed into the back room. The man tried to run, but he was quickly tackled to the ground, his hands pinned behind his back as he screamed in frustration. Sam stood frozen, the knife still in his hand, as two officers entered the room and untied the woman. She was sobbing, her body shaking with relief. One of the officers approached Sam, gently taking the knife from his hand and guiding him out of the room. You're safe now, the officer said, his voice steady. It's over. As Sam was led outside, he saw several police cars parked in the driveway, their lights flashing in the darkness. His mind was spinning, 
trying to process everything that had just happened. He was shaken but grateful to be alive. It turned out that the police had been watching the man for weeks. He'd been using Craigslist to lure people to his home, where he would either rob them or worse. The woman Sam had found had been missing for days, one of several people the police suspected had fallen victim to the man. Sam had been lucky. Had he not heard the woman's voice, had he left without investigating, he might have been next. As he sat on the curb, watching the officers lead the man away in handcuffs, Sam felt a chill run down his spine. He had always loved the thrill of a good deal, the excitement of finding something valuable for cheap. But now, he knew, some deals weren't worth the price. Sam deleted his Craigslist account the next day. He couldn't shake the memory of the man's eyes, that twisted smile, the way the house had felt like a trap waiting to spring shut. The laptop, the thing that had drawn him there in the first place, was evidence now, taken in by the police. Sam didn't care. He wanted nothing to do with it. Weeks later, when the nightmares began, when he would wake in a cold sweat, hearing that woman's desperate whisper in his sleep, he realized that some deals were far more dangerous than they seemed. No amount of money, no object, was worth putting his life on the line again. And he would never, never, answer another Craigslist ad again. When Claire moved to the city for her new job, she quickly realized that finding an affordable place to live wasn't going to be easy. Apartments were outrageously expensive, and the few decent places she found within her budget were either tiny or in sketchy neighborhoods. She had already exhausted her savings on deposits and moving expenses, so she needed a solution, fast. That's when she turned to Craigslist. Scrolling through listings late one night, she came across an ad that caught her eye. Room for rent in spacious, charming apartment dash $600 per month, utilities included. Female preferred. It sounded too good to be true. The photos showed a beautiful old brick apartment building, nestled in a quiet part of town. The interior looked cozy and clean, with hardwood floors, large windows, and a spacious kitchen. The price was almost unbelievable for a city as expensive as this one, but Claire was desperate. She quickly shot off an email to the address provided. The next morning, she received a response from a woman named Hannah. The message was warm and friendly. Hi Claire, I'd love to show you the place. It's available immediately, and your profile sounds like you'd be a great fit. Why don't you stop by tomorrow around 5 p.m. to take a look? Claire was relieved. The price was perfect, and the location looked ideal. She replied immediately, confirming the appointment. The following day, Claire arrived at the apartment building just before 5 p.m. It was even more charming in person, an old, red brick structure with ivy creeping up the sides. The neighborhood seemed quiet, a mix of old houses and well-kept apartment buildings. She buzzed Hannah's apartment, and moments later, the door clicked open. Inside, the building was just as cozy as the pictures had shown. The hallways smelled faintly of wood polish and old books. Claire took the stairs up to the third floor and knocked on the door marked 3B. The door opened to reveal Hannah, a petite, soft-spoken woman in her late twenties with dark hair and kind eyes. She smiled warmly, welcoming Claire inside. Hey, come on in. I'm so glad you could make it. Claire stepped into the apartment, and her first impression was overwhelmingly positive. The place was cozy and well-maintained. The living room was bright, with large windows letting in plenty of natural light. The kitchen was clean, and the spare room, Claire's potential new bedroom, was spacious and well-furnished. This is amazing, Claire said, smiling. It's perfect. I'm glad you like it, Hannah said. I've had a few people come by, but they didn't really seem like a good fit. But I have a good feeling about you. 
They talked for a bit, chatting about work, hobbies, and their schedules. Hannah seemed laid back but tidy, exactly the kind of roommate Claire was looking for. After about 30 minutes, they agreed that Claire would move in the following weekend. Claire left the apartment feeling a sense of relief. The search was over. Moving day went smoothly. Hannah helped Claire carry in her boxes and even baked cookies as a welcoming gesture. Over the next few weeks, Claire settled into her new life in the city. The apartment was perfect, and Hannah was a great roommate, quiet, considerate, and respectful of boundaries. At first, everything was normal. The two women kept to themselves most of the time, as they both had busy work schedules. But over time, Claire began to notice little things that seemed off. It started with the noises. At night, after Claire had gone to bed, she would hear faint sounds coming from Hannah's room. It was hard to tell what it was, maybe the creaking of the old building, or Hannah moving around, but it was consistent, every night around midnight. It almost sounded like whispering, but too quiet for Claire to make out any words. One evening, as Claire was getting ready for bed, she knocked on Hannah's door to ask if she'd heard the noises too, but there was no answer. Claire assumed Hannah was out, but when she pressed her ear against the door, she could hear faint movement inside the room, rustling, like someone was shuffling papers or packing things. Hannah. Claire called softly, but there was no response. The sounds stopped abruptly. Claire decided to let it go, chalking it up to Hannah being busy or distracted. She went to bed, but that night, the whispering noises returned, this time louder, almost like a conversation happening just outside her room. Weeks passed, and the strange occurrences became harder to ignore. There were nights when Claire would wake up to the sound of footsteps in the hallway, but when she opened her door, the apartment was empty. Other times, small objects in her room, her phone, her keys, would be moved slightly, as if someone had been in there while she was out. She started locking her door at night, but the unease remained. One day, while Hannah was out running errands, Claire decided to confront her growing suspicions. She felt guilty about invading her roommate's privacy, but something didn't feel right, and she needed answers. She approached Hannah's room and found the door slightly ajar. Pushing it open, Claire stepped inside. The room was surprisingly sparse, just a bed, a dresser, and a small desk. But something immediately caught her eye. On the desk was an old, leather-bound book. It was open to a page filled with strange, unfamiliar symbols and what looked like handwriting, scrawled in the margins. Claire's heart raced as she flipped through the book. The pages were filled with odd drawings, dark, twisted images of faces, some human, some not. There were diagrams, strange geometric patterns, and more of that cryptic writing. It looked ancient. Suddenly, Claire heard the sound of keys in the lock. Panic surged through her. She quickly shut the book and slid it back onto the desk, hurrying out of the room just as the front door swung open. Claire? Hannah called from the entryway. Hey. Claire responded, trying to keep her voice steady. I was just about to head out. Hannah appeared in the doorway, smiling as usual. Oh, okay. Hope you're settling in well. Claire forced a smile, but her heart was pounding. She grabbed her bag and hurried out the door, desperate to get away from the apartment. Claire couldn't shake the feeling that something was deeply wrong with Hannah. That night, the whispering returned, louder than ever. It sounded as though there were multiple voices murmuring just outside her bedroom door, speaking in a language she didn't understand. When she pressed her ear to the door, the whispers stopped. Unable to sleep, Claire began searching for answers. She started by digging into Hannah's online presence. But oddly, there was almost nothing, 
no social media profiles, no digital footprint at all, apart from the Craigslist ad. It was as if Hannah didn't exist outside of the apartment. Growing more paranoid, Claire decided to investigate the book she had found in Hannah's room. The next day, while Hannah was at work, Claire returned to the room. This time, she took photos of several pages from the strange book, hoping she could figure out what the symbols and writing meant. Later that evening, Claire sat in a coffee shop, scrolling through the photos she had taken. She decided to upload some of the images to a few online forums, hoping that someone might recognize the symbols. It didn't take long for someone to respond. A user on one of the forums sent her a private message, asking where she had found the book. The symbols are part of an ancient occult language, the message read. It's used in rituals. Dark rituals. You need to get out of there. Claire's stomach churned. Dark rituals. What was Hannah involved in? She tried to respond to the message, but before she could, her phone screen went black. The battery had died, despite being fully charged when she left the apartment. Suddenly, her phone buzzed back to life, but the screen was flashing erratically. Glancing down, Claire saw a text message appear. Hannah, where are you? Her blood ran cold. How did Hannah know she wasn't home? Claire hadn't told her she was going out. Panicked, Claire rushed back to the apartment. When she entered, the place was dark and silent. Hannah's room was closed, but there was no sound coming from inside. She quickly locked herself in her own room and called Sarah, her best friend, telling her everything that had happened. You need to leave, Sarah urged. Come stay with me for a few days. Just get out of there? But Claire couldn't just leave. She needed answers. The final straw came that night. Claire woke around 2 a.m. to the sound of the front door creaking open. She sat up, listening intently. There were footsteps in the hallway, soft and deliberate. Her heart pounded as the footsteps stopped just outside her door. For several moments, there was silence. Then, slowly, the door handle began to turn. Claire froze, her breath catching in her throat. She had locked the door before going to bed, but now the handle was moving, as though someone on the other side was trying to open it. She reached for her phone, dialing Sarah's number. But as soon as she hit call, the footsteps retreated. Moments later, her phone buzzed with a text message. Hannah, we need to talk. The next morning, Claire couldn't take it anymore. She confronted Hannah. Do you know what's been going on here? Claire demanded, her voice shaking. The noises, the book. What are you hiding? Hannah's expression remained calm, but her eyes darkened. You shouldn't have gone through my things, Claire, she said softly, almost regretfully. Claire felt a chill run down her spine. What are you doing in this apartment? What's that book? Hannah took a step closer, her smile eerily calm. You weren't supposed to see that. I chose you because I thought you'd be different. But you've seen too much now. Claire's blood ran cold. Chosen me. For what? Hannah's smile widened. For the ritual. Don't worry. It will all be over soon. Claire didn't wait to hear more. She grabbed her keys and bolted for the door, but Hannah was fast. She lunged, grabbing Claire's arm, her grip unnaturally strong. Claire screamed, yanking herself free, and ran out into the hallway. She didn't stop running until she reached her car. Her hands shook as she fumbled with the keys, finally getting the door open and speeding away from the apartment. As she drove, her phone buzzed again. Another text from Hannah. You can't run from this. 
Claire blocked the number, her heart racing as she drove towards Sarah's house. She wasn't sure what Hannah had planned, but she knew one thing, she was never going back to that apartment. Claire moved out the next day, leaving most of her things behind. She never saw Hannah again. The police investigated the apartment, but there was no sign of Hannah or the strange book Claire had found. It was as if Hannah had disappeared into thin air. Weeks later, Claire received a message from an unknown number. It was a new Craigslist ad, nearly identical to the one she had responded to. Room for rent in spacious, charming apartment dash $600 per month, utilities included. Female preferred. This time, Claire didn't reply. After months of scraping by in a cramped studio apartment, Megan finally had enough. The constant noise from her neighbors, the rising rent, and the lack of space made her feel suffocated. She knew she couldn't afford a bigger place on her own, but she wasn't keen on moving back in with her parents. That left one option, finding a roommate. Megan scrolled through the usual roommate finding websites, but nothing seemed right. Either the rent was too high, the locations were sketchy, or the potential roommates gave off weird vibes. Frustrated, she decided to check Craigslist as a last resort. She wasn't too fond of Craigslist, but a friend had found a decent apartment through it, so she figured it was worth a shot. After a few minutes of scrolling, she found a post that caught her eye, large room for rent, quiet area, affordable rent, female roommate preferred. The listing was straightforward, with pictures of a spacious bedroom, a cozy living room, and a nice kitchen. The rent was surprisingly cheap for the area, almost too good to be true. She clicked on the post, reading the brief description. Looking for a female roommate to share a two-bedroom apartment. Quiet neighborhood, lots of privacy. I'm pretty easygoing and keep to myself. No pets, no smoking. $450 a month, utilities included. Move in ASAP. Megan was intrigued. It sounded perfect. She could save some money, and the place looked nice enough. She shot off an email expressing her interest, half expecting to never hear back. To her surprise, she received a reply within an hour. Hi Megan. The room is still available. I'd love to meet you. Would you like to come see the place tomorrow evening? The email was from a woman named Emily. She didn't give much information about herself, but Megan figured that was normal, most people were careful about how much they shared online. They agreed to meet the following evening at the apartment. The next evening, Megan arrived at the address Emily had given her. It was a quiet neighborhood, as promised, with tree-lined streets and small, well-kept houses. The building itself was an older, two-story apartment complex, nothing fancy but not run down either. As Megan walked up to the door, she felt a small twinge of nerves. She had never found a place through Craigslist before, and though she'd heard horror stories about bad roommates, this didn't seem too bad so far. Emily answered the door almost as soon as Megan knocked. She was a petite woman, probably in her late twenties, with short brown hair and a friendly smile. She was dressed casually in a sweater and jeans, her demeanor warm and welcoming. You must be Megan, she said, opening the door wider to let her in. Come on in. I'll show you around. The apartment was just as nice as it had looked in the pictures. The living room was cozy, with a large couch and a coffee table cluttered with books. The kitchen was small but tidy, and the hallway led to two bedrooms, one of which Emily said was hers. The other was the room for rent. It's a nice space, Megan said, admiring the room. The rent was almost suspiciously low for how nice everything looked, but Emily explained that she had gotten a deal on the place because her uncle owned the building. I just need someone to help with the rent, she added. They sat down to talk for a while, 
and Megan got a good feeling about Emily. She was polite, seemed normal, and wasn't too pushy about making a decision on the spot. Emily explained that she worked from home as a freelance graphic designer, which was why she liked to keep the apartment quiet. Megan didn't mind that, she wasn't the partying type anyway. After about an hour of talking, Megan decided she'd take the room. The rent was too good to pass up, and Emily seemed like someone she could get along with. The first few weeks in the new apartment went smoothly. Megan moved her things in, and the two women fell into an easy routine. Emily kept mostly to herself, working long hours in her room or at the kitchen table. Megan worked at a coffee shop during the day and spent most evenings in her room watching TV or reading. Emily was a little reserved, but Megan didn't mind. In fact, she preferred having a roommate who wasn't all up in her business. They talked occasionally, mostly about light topics like TV shows or books, but for the most part, they kept to their own spaces. However, as time went on, Megan started noticing a few things that made her uneasy. Emily had some strange habits. For one, she was extremely secretive about her room. Whenever Megan walked past, the door was always shut, and Emily never let her see inside. Once, when Megan had come home early, she had seen Emily standing in the doorway of her room, staring at something inside. When she realized Megan was there, she quickly shut the door and gave a nervous smile. Another oddity was that Emily had a strict rule about the basement. Megan had noticed the door early on and assumed it was for storage or maybe a laundry room, but when she asked about it, Emily had been surprisingly firm. We don't go down there, she said, her tone leaving no room for argument. It's just some old storage stuff. Nothing important. The way Emily had said it made Megan's skin crawl, but she brushed it off. She figured everyone had their quirks, and as long as Emily was a good roommate, it didn't really matter. Still, the basement door gave her an uneasy feeling whenever she passed it. Then, the noises started. It was subtle at first. Late at night, Megan would hear faint sounds coming from the direction of Emily's room. It sounded like a low humming or whispering, too quiet to make out clearly. At first, she thought it was just Emily talking on the phone or watching TV. But the more Megan listened, the stranger it became. The sounds were too rhythmic, too deliberate, to be a casual conversation. And then there was the fact that they happened at the same time every night, between 2 o'clock and 3 a.m. No matter what day it was, the noises always began at 2 o'clock sharp and stopped exactly an hour later. Megan's unease grew. She tried to ask Emily about it once, casually mentioning that she'd heard some odd sounds at night, but Emily brushed it off with a laugh. Oh, I must have been watching something, she said, not meeting Megan's eyes. But the sounds continued. Every night. And now, Megan noticed other things, strange things. Emily seemed more distant, almost. Vacant. Sometimes, she would walk into the living room and stare at Megan as if she had forgotten who she was, only to snap out of it moments later and act normal again. The atmosphere in the apartment began to change. The air felt heavier, and there was a constant sense of unease, like someone, or something, was watching. Megan's dreams became strange and fragmented, filled with shadows and whispers. She often woke up in the middle of the night, her heart pounding, drenched in sweat. And always, when she woke, the noises from Emily's room were there, just at the edge of hearing. One evening, when Emily was out, Megan couldn't take it anymore. She needed to know what was going on. She had tried to respect Emily's privacy, but the tension in the apartment had become unbearable. And then there was the basement door, it called to her in a way that made her skin crawl. Something was wrong, and Megan was determined to find out what. She waited until she was sure Emily wouldn't be back for hours. 
Then, with her heart pounding in her chest, she approached the basement door. It was locked, but the lock was old, and Megan was able to pry it open with a butter knife. The door creaked as it swung inward, revealing a steep, narrow staircase descending into darkness. She grabbed a flashlight from the kitchen drawer and took a deep breath before stepping down. The basement smelled of mildew and something else, something foul. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, the beam of her flashlight illuminated old, dusty boxes, rusty metal shelves, and cobwebs hanging from the ceiling. At first, it looked like nothing more than a neglected storage area. But then Megan noticed a small door at the far end of the room, almost hidden behind some boxes. It was smaller than the basement door, and unlike the rest of the basement, this door was pristine, almost new. Her heart raced as she approached it. The door wasn't locked. She hesitated for a moment, but something inside her pushed her to open it. Behind the door was a small room. The walls were bare concrete, the air damp and cold. In the center of the room was something that made Megan's stomach drop, a large, circular pattern drawn on the floor in what looked like dried blood. Symbols she didn't recognize were scrawled in a language she couldn't read, and in the middle of the circle lay what appeared to be a bundle of dark, matted hair. As she stared, horrified, she heard a sound behind her, a soft creak. She spun around to see Emily standing at the top of the basement stairs, her eyes wide with fury. What are you doing down there? Emily's voice was calm, too calm, but her eyes were wild. Megan's heart pounded in her chest. She tried to speak, but the words caught in her throat. I told you not to go down there, Emily said, stepping closer. You shouldn't have gone down there. Megan backed away, but Emily was already descending the stairs, her movements slow, deliberate. I didn't want to do this, Emily whispered, her voice almost regretful. But you forced my hand. Megan turned and ran, her legs shaking as she stumbled up the stairs, her mind racing. She had to get out. She didn't know what was happening, but she knew she had to escape. But just as she reached the door, Emily grabbed her, her grip inhumanly strong. You should have listened, Emily hissed, her eyes wide and crazed. It's too late now. Megan struggled, her heart racing, adrenaline surging through her veins. She managed to wrench herself free, slamming the basement door behind her. She bolted for the front door, her hands shaking as she fumbled with the lock. She could hear Emily behind her, moving fast, her footsteps pounding across the floor. Megan yanked the door open and ran, not looking back until she was out of the building, out into the cold night air. She didn't stop running until she was far away, her lungs burning, her mind reeling. When she finally stopped, she collapsed on a park bench, gasping for breath, her hands trembling. She pulled out her phone and dialed 911. The police arrived within minutes, and Megan told them everything about Emily, the noises, the basement, the strange symbols. They didn't seem to believe her at first, but when they investigated the apartment, they found the basement exactly as she had described it. But there was no sign of Emily. The police launched a search, but Emily seemed to have vanished without a trace. Her online presence was wiped clean, and no one in the neighborhood seemed to know anything about her. It was as if she had never existed. Megan moved out of the city soon after, still haunted by the events in that apartment. She never found out who, or what, Emily really was. All she knew was that she had come dangerously close to something dark and evil, something that had been waiting for her in that apartment. And she had learned one thing for certain, you can never trust what you find on Craigslist. For generations, the residents of Green Hollow had whispered stories about Hollow Hill Cemetery, a decrepit graveyard hidden deep in the woods just outside town. The cemetery had long been abandoned, overtaken by the elements, its grey stones cracked and weathered by time. 
It was said that the land was cursed, a place where the dead never rested, where something far darker than ghosts lingered in the shadows. Few dared to visit the cemetery, especially after dark. The stories varied, some spoke of strange figures roaming between the graves, others of disembodied voices that called out to anyone foolish enough to venture near. But the most chilling legend was about the grave of William Gaunt, a notorious grave robber and suspected occultist who was buried there nearly two centuries ago. According to legend, Gaunt had been caught plundering graves in search of forbidden knowledge. He had claimed that by communing with the dead, he could unlock the secrets of eternal life. But instead of immortality, he found only madness. After his capture, Gaunt was executed and buried in Hollow Hill Cemetery, far from consecrated ground. His grave was sealed with an iron chain and marked with a warning to any, who might disturb him, here lies William Gaunt. Let the dead keep their secrets. Despite the warnings, it was said that Gaunt's restless spirit still lingered in the cemetery, guarding the secrets he had stolen from the graves he violated. It was a chilly autumn night when Mark, Danny, Rachel, and Claire found themselves at the local bar, swapping ghost stories. Mark, always the skeptic, scoffed at the tales about Hollow Hill. You guys can't seriously believe that stuff, Mark said, leaning back in his chair with a smirk. It's just a bunch of old superstitions. Claire, the most superstitious of the group, shivered. You've never been there, Mark. It's not just a story. My grandma always said people who went looking for trouble in Hollow Hill never came back the same. Then why don't we check it out for ourselves? Danny suggested, a mischievous grin on his face. He had always been the one to push things too far, and tonight was no exception. I say we go to the cemetery, see if there's any truth to these ghost stories. Rachel, ever the cautious one, shook her head. I don't know, Danny. That place gives me the creeps. There's a reason no one goes out there anymore. Mark, emboldened by the drinks and determined to prove the stories wrong, laughed. Come on, what's the worst that could happen? We go, look around, and then you'll see there's nothing out there but old stones and overgrown weeds. After some coaxing, Rachel reluctantly agreed, and before long, the group was piling into Mark's truck, flashlights in hand, ready to face whatever waited in Hollow Hill Cemetery. The drive to Hollow Hill took them down winding, narrow roads that grew darker and more desolate as they approached the cemetery. The trees pressed in close, their skeletal branches forming a canopy overhead, blocking out the moonlight. By the time they arrived, the temperature had dropped, and a dense fog had begun to settle over the ground. Mark parked the truck at the edge of the woods, just outside the cemetery gates. The iron gate was rusted and overgrown with vines, hanging open at a crooked angle as if no one had passed through it in years. Here we are, Mark said, turning off the engine. See? Nothing to be scared of. But as they got out of the truck and approached the gate, the air seemed to grow colder, and an unnatural silence settled over the area. No birds, no rustling leaves just the soft crunch of their footsteps on the dirt path leading into the cemetery. The gravestones were old and broken, some barely visible beneath the overgrown grass and ivy. A few headstones stood tall, their inscriptions weathered and worn by time. Others had crumbled, reduced to nothing more than jagged slabs of stone. Creepy, Claire muttered, hugging her jacket tighter around her shoulders. I can't believe we're doing this. Rachel stayed close to Danny, her flashlight flickering as they made their way deeper into the cemetery. Let's just look around and leave. This place gives me the creeps. Relax, Mark said, leading the way. We're here to see if there's any truth to the stories. Nothing's going to happen. They wandered among the gravestones for a while, reading the faded names and dates, but nothing out of the ordinary happened. 
Just as Mark was about to declare victory and suggest they head back, Claire called out. Guys! Over here! They followed her voice to a small clearing near the back of the cemetery, where a large, imposing gravestone stood. It was different from the others, larger, more elaborate, with an inscription that was still clearly legible despite its age. The name William Gaunt was carved deep into the stone, along with the chilling warning, let the dead keep their secrets. Chains, long rusted and broken, lay scattered around the grave. The sight of it sent a shiver down Rachel's spine. This is it, Danny whispered, awe in his voice. William Gaunt's grave. Claire stepped back, her eyes wide. We shouldn't be here. Mark, on the other hand, was grinning. This is the famous grave, ha. Huh? Let's see if he really is still guarding his secrets. Before anyone could stop him, Mark stepped forward and kicked one of the chains. The clattering sound echoed unnaturally through the cemetery. Mark, stop. Rachel cried, her voice panicked. That's not funny, but it was too late. As soon as Mark touched the chain, the wind picked up, swirling around them with a sudden ferocity. The fog thickened, curling through the trees and around the gravestones like fingers reaching up from the earth. And then they heard it, a low, guttural whisper that seemed to come from everywhere at once. A voice, ancient and angry, carried on the wind. You shouldn't have come. The wind howled through the trees, shaking the branches overhead, but it was the voice that truly terrified them. It wasn't the wind, and it wasn't an animal. It was something else, something that didn't belong to the living. Did you guys hear that? Claire's voice shook as she clutched Danny's arm. Rachel took a step back, her eyes wide with fear. We need to leave. Now. But before they could move, the ground beneath them began to tremble, as though something deep beneath the earth was stirring. The once crumbling gravestones seemed to shift in place, and the air was filled with an oppressive energy that pressed down on them like a heavy weight. Mark's bravado quickly faded as he glanced nervously around. Okay. Maybe we should. He didn't finish his sentence. A loud crack echoed through the cemetery, and suddenly, one of the gravestones near William Gaunt's grave split in half. A gaping hole opened in the earth, and from its depths came a thick, foul-smelling mist. The voice returned, louder this time, more insistent, leave. Before it's too late. The group froze, paralyzed by fear. The mist began to take shape, swirling together until it formed a shadowy figure standing just beyond the grave. It was tall and gaunt, its form indistinct, but its eyes, glowing red in the darkness, were unmistakably fixed on them. You've disturbed the dead, the voice hissed. And now the dead will claim you. Without another word, they bolted, racing back toward the entrance of the cemetery. But the fog had thickened, obscuring their path. The gravestones seemed to loom closer, the trees pressing in from all sides as if the cemetery itself was trying to trap them. Rachel tripped over a broken gravestone, crying out in pain as she hit the ground. Danny grabbed her arm, pulling her to her feet, but as they looked around, they realized something horrible, the cemetery was no longer just a graveyard. Shadows were moving between the stones, figures emerging from the fog, their eyes glowing in the darkness. Go? Mark yelled, panic in his voice. Run. They sprinted toward the gate, but the mist was everywhere, thick and suffocating. The shadows move with unnatural speed, circling them, whispering incomprehensible words that sent shivers down their spines. Just as they reached the gate, Claire let out a scream. One of the shadows had grabbed her arm, its icy fingers wrapping around her wrist. She struggled, pulling away, but the shadow was too strong. Its form twisted and shifted, becoming more solid, more real, 
as it dragged her back toward the graves. Help me? Claire cried, her voice filled with terror. Danny and Mark rushed to her side, grabbing her arms and pulling with all their strength. For a moment, it seemed like they might free her, but the shadow only tightened its grip. You belong to us now, the voice whispered, sending a chill through their bones. With one final tug, the shadow yanked Claire into the fog. She disappeared, her scream echoing through the cemetery as the mist swallowed her whole. The remaining three ran, terror fueling their every step. They didn't stop until they were far from the cemetery, collapsing on the side of the road, gasping for breath. But even though they had escaped the graveyard, the darkness clung to them like a second skin. The whispers hadn't stopped, they lingered in their minds, as if the curse of Hollow Hill had followed them. We have to go back for Claire, Rachel sobbed, her voice breaking with fear. Mark shook his head, his face pale. We can't. You saw what happened. She's. She's gone. But we can't just leave her. Rachel protested. Danny, who had been staring blankly into the woods, finally spoke. It's not over. Gaunt. He's going to come for us. All of us. The next few days were a blur of fear and paranoia. Each of them returned home, but the feeling of being watched never left them. Shadows seemed to move in the corners of their vision, strange noises echoed through their homes at night, and every time they closed their eyes, they heard the whispers of the dead. One by one, they began to see figures, dark, shadowy forms lurking at the edge of their vision. At first, they thought it was their imagination, but the figures grew bolder, appearing closer and closer, until there was no denying it. Something was following them. Rachel was the first to disappear. Her parents found her room empty one morning, her bed undisturbed, as though she had simply vanished into thin air. Her phone and belongings were still there, but Rachel was gone, leaving no trace. A week later, Mark was found in his apartment, his face pale and contorted in terror, his body cold and lifeless. The coroner ruled it as a heart attack, but Danny knew better. He had seen the shadows creeping closer in the days leading up to Mark's death. He knew what was coming. Now, only Danny remained. It had been nearly a month since that fateful night in Hollow Hill Cemetery, and Danny hadn't slept in days. Every time he closed his eyes, the nightmares returned, visions of Claire being dragged into the earth, of Rachel's terrified face, of the shadowy figure that had haunted them all. He had tried everything to protect himself, staying in crowded places, leaving the lights on, avoiding sleep, but nothing worked. The shadows still came for him, growing bolder with each passing night. Tonight was different. Danny knew this would be his final night. The air in his apartment was thick with tension, and the whispers were louder than ever. The lights flickered, casting long, distorted shadows on the walls. He could feel the presence of something just beyond the door, waiting for him. With trembling hands, Danny grabbed a knife from the kitchen, though he knew it wouldn't help. The curse of William Gaunt couldn't be fought with steel. The dead had already claimed him, and there was no escaping it. The room grew colder, and the shadows began to move, swirling together into a single, towering form. The figure from the cemetery stood before him, its glowing red eyes fixed on him. You should have let the dead keep their secrets, the voice hissed. Danny backed into a corner, his heart pounding in his chest. I'm sorry, he whispered, tears streaming down his face. I didn't mean to. But it was too late. The shadows enveloped him, pulling him into the darkness, just as they had done with the others. His scream echoed through the empty apartment, and then there was only silence. Months passed, and the story of Danny, Claire, Mark, and Rachel became just another local legend in Green Hollow. Their disappearances were never solved, and the town quickly moved on, 
chalking it up to tragedy and misfortune. But Hollow Hill Cemetery remained, its gates rusted and its gravestones crumbling. The fog still lingered around the graves, and the whispers of the dead continued to call out to anyone foolish enough to listen. And William Gaunt's grave, with its broken chains, waited for the next group of curious souls to disturb the secrets that should have stayed buried. Because the dead do not forgive.